name, bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. Let me take the time out to welcome you again to another evening of Bible study. Um, it's good that, you know, we are here to share in the word of the Lord God another time. He has spared our lives and we are here to share in the word of the Lord another time. Amen. Let me take time out to welcome you again, whether you're tuning in now or sometime in the future. You know, we pray that, you know, God blessings will be upon you. Let us just breathe a word of prayer before we get into our discussion. Father, in the name of Jesus, we bless your great name one more time. We magnify you. We adore you. We lift you up. We thank you, great God, for your love. We thank you for your mercies. We thank you for your blessings. We thank you for your grace, Lord. As we are here to have another session of Bible study, as we discuss your word, we pray, God, that you will be in our midst. We pray, God, that you will give your people a word, that you will encourage, that you will strengthen. We pray, God, that when all is said and done, that you and you alone will receive the glory. Let your perfect will be done, we ask, in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name, amen. So we have been on the topic of the dispensation, the seven dispensations for a couple of weeks. And we thank God that, you know, for these past couple of weeks, he has been with us. And the last week, we spent the time and we talked about the dispensation of human government, right? And we said that the dispensation of human government got its name because, you know, it was the first time that man was able now to govern himself, you know, after the flood that wiped out everyone on the face of the earth except for Noah and his family. You know, God now brought in a different dispensation. And, you know, man was now able to govern himself. Now, after Noah came from the ark, the first thing we said that Noah did was that he made an offering unto the Lord of every kind of clean beast and fowl. And the Bible says that when he did that, it, it was a sweet-smelling sweet Savior unto God. And then God said, because of this, he's going to enter into a covenant with Noah, right? And we have seen from that time until now that God has been dealing with people in covenant. And as we get into the next dispensation of promise, we will see another covenant being made. So after the flood and Noah did the sacrifice, God made a covenant with Noah, right? And he promised Noah that, you know, he will not destroy the earth again, you know, with, with, with flood. But, and then he said that when you see the sign of the rainbow, it, it is a covenant. It is a sign of the covenant to say that I will not destroy the earth again with water. You know, even the other day rain fell and I saw the rainbow and, and the first thing that came to my mind, God said that he will not destroy the earth again with flood. You know, we look at the scripture in Second Peter 3, 6 to 7 and we said that, you know, Peter declared that the next destruction will be by fire, right? And God will not destroy the earth again by, with water but by fire, you know? And we said that all that was expected in the dispensation of human government was that the people be fruitful, multiply, and replenish the earth. God expected them to go, you know, in different sections of the earth to, to replenish the earth, right? But when we look in the dispensation, we recognize that again man failed, right? The humanistic reasoning of men took over and they decided to do differently from the command of God. The first record of sin we had in the dispensation of human government was with Noah. Noah was the one that God gave charge to say, you know, these are the things that you should go by. These are the things that will govern you in this dispensation. And the first thing that happened in this dispensation was drunkenness. Noah was, Noah um, plant a vineyard. And as soon as, you know, the, 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 the the grapes, they bear fruit. Noah made wine and he drank so much of that wine and he got drunk, right? 
And then we look at how the people gather together in one place. God said to them, scatter. And the people came together and they decide based on the influence of Nimrod to build a city and a tower. And this city and a tower, they said that would reach heaven. So here again, in this dispensation that we discussed last week of human government, we said in the dispensation of contents that there was rebellion. Cain was rebellious. And the people at that time, they rebel against God. And we see now in the dispensation of human government, another height of rebellion, the people rebel against God. And, and the, 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 the tower and the city that they were building was saying to God, God, we do not care about what you have said. What we want to do is to build our city. We want to remain in one place. And it was saying to God, God, look here. You can say what you want to say, but we are going to do what we want to do. They wanted to stay in one place. And this was the very thing that God told them not to do. Don't stay in one place. So the third dispensation that we look at, which, is, which was a dispensation of human government, the people, they rebelled against God. So what God did was that he stopped the building of the city and he stopped the building of the tower by changing the language. We're just doing a quick recap. And then he enforced his commandment by changing the language. At that time, the people spoke one language. And then what God did in order to confound the people was that he enforced his, his, his plan by causing the changing of the language. People now speak different language. So if a man say, pass me a spanner, um, pass me a hammer or something like that, you know, the man would not, the other person on the other end would not understand. So God put a, put a, a rod in the spoke, so to speak. And the building of the city and the building of the tower stopped. God divided humanity into different language groups and his sovereign will to populate the earth was accomplished. Right? We also look at the judgment and we say that, you know, the same thing that God used to confound the people, to deliver them, to deliver them, right, is the same thing that God used to judge them, which was the changing of the language. We said Nimrod was a tyrant. He ruled the people with an iron fist. And God, in a move to deliver them from under this leadership, in a bid to deliver them from his wrath, he used the changing of the language to disperse them and to carry out his will. So remember we said that in every dispensation, right? One of the, th there are three things that we should note. One is that, you know, God singles out an individual, a man, so to speak, to represent him. When we look back at this dispensation between the dispensation of conscience and human government, we recognize that Noah was the man and the responsibility was given to Noah. Noah represent God from in the dispensation of conscience through to the dispensation of human government. Then now, when we get into the other dispensation, you will see where God will select a man to represent him. The second thing we should note, we said, is that we should observe certain orders or commandments of the passing dispensation and how they are brought over into the new dispensation. Thirdly, we said that we should note the new things that are introduced into the new dispensation. So the dispersing of the people from, from the land where they were, by God changing the language, was a way for God to now single out this one man that should represent him in the dispensation, the upcoming dispensation, which is the dispensation of promise that we will now begin to look at. Let us now go to our slides as we get into the dispensation of promise. Remember we said, how is it that we are going to look at these dispensations? Just a quick reminder. We said that we are going to you know, have seven points and we are going to stick to, this, to these seven points. There are some, so you will notice that as we go through the different dispensations, there are some, some other things that happen in the dispensation that we do not discuss. Like we said from previous weeks, if we had discussed these things, 
you know, we would still be probably on the first or the second dispensation. But we are going to stick with, you know, these seven points. We are going to look at what happened at the beginning of the dispensation, who were involved, the commandment that was given or what was expected. Look at the failure to obey God's commandment. Look at the judgment that was handed out. The mode of deliverance, are, are the one or two takeaway from each dispensation, and what is it that we can learn about the Lord. So, you know, this is, you know, what we are going to follow as we continue with our discussion. All right, let us go to the next slide. So, as we look at the, dif the dispensation, the beginning of the dispensation, point one, it is the fourth dispensation, and it is called the dispensation of promise. And as we go through the dispensation of promise, we are going to recognize that God gave out many promises, and we are going to recognize that with, with the patriarchs, God called Abraham and he made him a promise. He, Jacob he, he gave him a promise. Isaac, he gave him a promise. And he renewed that promise again, even to the children of Israel, as he was about to deliver them from out of the land of Egypt. Right, so the fourth dispensation is the dispensation of promise, and it started with the call of Abraham and ended with the exodus of the Jewish people from Egypt. It was a period of about 640 plus years. If you, you, know, you do read certain material, they will tell you that you know, it was about 430 years. But if it starts with the call of Abraham, you would have to look at the age of Abraham. You would have to look at the age of Isaac, the age of Jacob, and you know, the time when the 70 went down into Egypt. And then you'd have to calculate those years. So based on my calculation, it's about 640 plus years you know, the, the, the dispensation lasted for. So the stewards of the dispensation were Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and their descendants that we call the children of Israel. Let us look at now the call of Abraham, right? That is found in Genesis chapter 12, 1 to 5. So God called Abraham. Abraham, after God dispersed the people from the tower, from building the tower and the city, there was a time between dispensation and God now chose to call forth one man that would represent him now into the next dispensation. And this man that God chose to call was Abraham, right? And we're looking at Genesis chapter 12, 1 to 5. Now the Lord said unto Abraham, Get thee out of thy country, and from thy kindred, and from thy father's house, unto a land that I will show thee. And I will make of thee a great nation, and I will bless thee, and I will make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. And I will bless them that bless thee, and curse them that curse thee, and in thee shall all the families of the earth be blessed. So Abraham departed as the Lord had spoken unto him, and Lot went with him. And Abraham was seventy and five years old when he departed out of Haran. And Abraham took Sarai his wife, and Lot went. Sarah, his wife, and Lot, his brother's son, and all their substance that they had gathered, and the souls that they had gotten in Haran, and they went forth to go into the land of Canaan, and into the land of Canaan they came. Amen. So the basic promise during this dispensation was the Abrahamic covenant. So we said in the dispensation of human government that God now made a covenant with Noah and we are seeing now in this dispensation where God again would now make a covenant with Abraham. Right, so this, 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 what we're looking at now are this passage that we have read spoke about the Abrahamic covenant, right? And what does it involve? From Abraham would come a great nation. God would bless 
Abraham naturally and he'll bless him spiritually. He'll bless Abraham so that Abraham would have descendants. He would have great nation. Because at this time, when, when God called Abraham at age 75, Abraham had no child, had no seed, no one to call here. And it, it, it was just him and his wife. And, you know, you can see that he took Lot, which was his nephew, as, you know, his own son, like his own son. And when he departed out of Aaron, right, he departed with Lot. So God would make Abraham's name great. This is a part of the covenant, which means that Abraham would be known right around the world, right? And then God would bless those who bless Abraham and his descendants and would curse those who curse them, right? And so because we are spiritual children of Abraham, you know, it, it, the same thing goes for us. God will bless us, bless our descendants, and he will curse those who look to curse us. Instead, in Abraham shall all the families of the earth be blessed. And this was a true statement because in Jesus Christ, all the families of the earth be blessed. And Jesus was, um, Jesus came through the lineage of Abraham. So in him, in his seed shall all the families of the earth be blessed. And we saw that all the families of the earth is blessed in Jesus Christ through his salvation work. And the sign of the covenant now, right, would be that of circumcision. So what happened here at circumcision is that, you know, from eight days old, I think that, you know, the, 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 the family would take the boys and they would cut the foreskin away from their penis. And, you know, that is considered circumcision. And God said, this is a covenant. This is the sign of the covenant between me and you. This is what ha have to happen with all your generation because this is the sign of the covenant. Right, so let us go. To the, so look at it now. Abraham, so Abraham begat Isaac, Isaac begat Jacob, right? And Jacob begat, you know, Reuben, Simeon, Levi, Judah, Dan, Naphtali, God, Asher, Ishakar, Zebulun, Joseph, and Benjamin. So these are the 12 sons of Jacob that we refer to, the 12 tri tribes of Israel. So in Genesis chapter 12, God called Abraham out of one place, right? And he called him out of in, 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 his home, everything that he knew. And God called to him in a new place, right? And God said unto him, get thee out of thy country and out of thy kindred, out of thy father's house, unto a place that I will show thee. This was not an easy assignment. Right? This was not easy for Abraham to have left everything that he knew and went to a place that he knew nothing about. We can go to the next slide. So can you imagine that I remember I remember about six years ago I went to Texas. I knew nobody in Texas, but it's easier now, you know. And I was a bit worried because you know, how is it that I'm going to move around? How, who is it that I know? And I tried to find folks that I, that, that I know who live in Texas to help, to, you know, to guide me or to, you know, show me the ropes. And, you know, I just brave up. There was just this difficulty going. And I just brave up, you know. In this time now, you have, you have what you call the taxi that you can just call and Uber. And you can just move and just do what you want to do. So... I went there and I didn't have a problem. I, I got through and I do what I had to do and then I came back. But for Abraham to have left everything that he knew and went to a place that God called him, it was not easy. It was not an easy a a, a, a assignment. It was difficult, but God called him to leave some things behind. And I want to encourage us, Virgin, and help us to understand that even in today, day as we walk, 
with God. God is still calling us to leave some things behind. The things that, you know, come between us and him, the things that would disrupt the relationship between us and God. God is still calling us to leave those things behind. I want us to know, Bridget, that whatever we put before God, whatever we put in front of God, amen, it, it is... It is saying that, God, we put this thing before you and we worship this, this thing. You see, anything that you, that you give your time to, bless the name of God. It, you put the thing in front of God and God is calling us to leave those things to, behind. The next point says that Abraham, father, Tira was an idolater. In other words, he did not worship the true and living God. And God called Abraham from out of that family to come and serve the true and living God. And he called him from an idolatrous family. He called him from being an idolater and to come and worship me, the true and living God. And I'm saying to us that God is calling us, brethren, away from some things that comes between we and him. God wants to have personal relationship with us. And we knew this. We recognized this from the first dispensation. When God would come down in the cool of the day. But no. God is saying to us. He's calling us away. From the things that would separate. Us. From him. So Abraham's father was an. Idolater. He did not worship the true and living God. Right, he served other gods. Abraham's family did not worship or serve the true and living God, and God called him out of that. Abraham did as the Lord commanded him in Genesis 12, verse 4. And we read it a while ago. We said that Abraham departed as the Lord had spoken unto him. Yeah, I, I like this. It's to the obedience as God call out unto him and say, look, you leave. So Abraham departed as the Lord had spoken unto him. And Lot went with him. And Abraham was 75 years old when he departed out of Aaron. So Abraham did as God commanded him to. Followed the command of God. God called him to leave an idolatrous family. And it was hard for him because he would have left everything that he knew. But he, the Bible said, did as the Lord commanded him. So God made a, 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 a promise, made a covenant with Abraham from you know, Genesis chapter 12, 1 to 5 that we read. But we recognize now that as Abraham continued his journey with the Lord and continue to move from place to place in the promised land that God keep on reiterated the promise to him. Now when we look at Genesis chapter 15, let us find that one. Genesis chapter 15 18 we find the Lord again saying to Abraham that you know he gave his descendants the land. He said, in the same day the Lord made a covenant with Abraham, saying, unto thy seed will I give this land from the river of Egypt unto the great river Euphrates. So the Lord again said to him, you know, because when God called him out of Aaron and as he, he, as he ventured into the promised land, he did not stop at one place in the promised land. You know, He was moving from from a section of the land to another section of the land. He was going around and, and so to speak, and God would have him to be viewing all of the land that God promised him and promised his descendants. So God said to him that I am going to give your descendants this land. So again, we see where the Lord reiterated the promise to Abraham. Let us go to Genesis chapter 17 from verse 3 through to verse 8. So 
we now recognize why the dispensation is characterized as the dispensation of promise. Because God made a promise, he called Abraham and he made a promise to him. And we recognize that as Abraham continued to, to go around in the promised land, that God continued to reiterate the promise with him. And Abraham fell on his face and God talked with him, saying, as for me, behold, my covenant is with thee, and thou shalt be a father of many nations. Neither shall thy name any more be called Abraham, but thy name shall be called Abraham, for a father of many nations I have made thee. And I will make thee exceedingly fruitful, and I will make nations of thee, and kings shall come out of thee. And I will establish my covenant between me and thee, and thy seed after thee, in their generations, for an everlasting covenant, to be a God unto thee, and to thy seed after thee. And I will give unto thee, and to thy seed after thee, the land wherein thou art a stranger, all the land of Canaan for an everlasting possession, and I will be their God unto thy seed after thee. And I will give unto thee, to thy seed after thee, and the land wherein thou art a stranger, and all the land of Canaan, an everlasting possession, I will be their God. So all these promises. All these promises God gave to Abraham when he had no seed. I want us to note that, you know, he had no son, no children, no one to call his own except for his wife. And Abraham, God gave him the promise, made promises unto him when he had no one To call his seed. But the Lord continued to reiterate. Time after time. God would say to Abraham. Look here. I am going to give you this land. I am going to give your children this land. I am going to be their God. I am going to make a covenant with you. What was it about Abraham that God saw? And God was willing to say. That I am going to make a covenant with you. What was it that God saw? Of Abraham, why he called him from the land of Aaron for him to leave everything behind and come and worship the true and living God. There must have been something, right? So God kept on reiterating the promise to Abraham. God also gave the same promises to Isaac. Let us go to the next slide and look at Genesis chapter 26, 1 through 2, 5. All these promises God gave Abraham when he had no child, right? When the child came, so he received the promises, the promise at a certain age. And when the child came and become a man, God now made the promise to Isaac. He renewed the promise to Isaac. So Genesis 26, 1. And there was a famine in the land beside the first famine that was in the days of Abraham. And Isaac went to Abimelech, king of the Philistine, and to Gerar. And the Lord appeared unto him and said, Go not into Egypt. Dwell in the land which I shall tell thee of. Sojourn in this land, and I will be with thee. I will bless thee, for unto thee and unto thy seed will I give all these countries. And I will perform the oath which I swear unto Abraham thy father. And I will make thy seed to multiply as the stars of heaven. And I will give unto thy seed all these countries. And in thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed. 
because that Abraham obeyed my voice and kept my charge and my commandment, my statutes and my laws. So, God gave the promise to Abraham when Abraham was sanctified, he called him, and he had no son. The promised son Isaac did not come until he was 100 years old. And you can read that in Genesis chapter 21, verse 5, right? So, the same promises that God gave to Abraham was the same promise we, know, we see now in Genesis chapter 26, 1 to 5 that we just read. That God gave to Isaac, he renewed the promise and gave Isaac the same promise. He, God was set on doing a work. He was set on making a nation. He was set on having a people for himself. And he spoke the word and he brought it to pass. So God also gave the same promises to Isaac, to Jacob, sorry, which is Isaac's, Isaac's son. And that is Genesis chapter 28, 10 through to 15. And Jacob went from Bathsheba and went towards Haran. And he lighted up on a certain place and tarried there all night because the sun was set. And he took up the stones of that place and put them for his pillow and lay down in that place to sleep. And he dreamed. And behold, a ladder set up on the earth and the top of it reached to heaven. And behold, an angel of God ascending, angel of God, of God descending and ascending on it. And behold, the Lord stood above it and said, I am the Lord God of Abraham, thy father, and the God of Isaac, the land whereon thou lies, to thee I will give it, and to thy seed. And thy seed shall be as the dust of the earth, and thou shalt spread abroad to the west, and to the east, and to the north, and to the south, and in thee in thy seed shall all the families of the earth be blessed. And behold, I am with thee, and I will keep thee in all places whither thou goest, and will bring thee again into this land, for I will not leave thee until I have done that which I have spoken thee to thee of. So these three men, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, were given special promises. So God made his promise to, to, to Abraham. He renewed the promise to Abraham on more than one occasion. He then made the same promise to Isaac and to Jacob. These men were given special promises. God had given them his word that he would do a certain thing, right? And it was their responsibility to believe God. But I want us to understand, Virgin, that if God makes a promise, God will never break his promises, right? And if God give you his word, he will stay true to his word. Man may not keep his promises, but God always keep his words. His words are yea and amen. And if he said that he will do it, consider it, brethren, a done deal. Let us go to point two, which is the command that was given or what was expected of mankind. We, as we've been going through the dispensation, we, dispensations, we recognize that man feel in the dispensation of conscience, Fail in the dispensation of innocence. Fail in the dispensation of human government. And we are now looking at, you know, the command that was given. Will man be able to live up to, to, to the requirement of God in this dispensation? Or 
is it that men will choose to do otherwise? Let us look. So mankind failing all of those dispensation, right? And here we are in the fourth dispensation. The patriarchs and their descendants were to one, believe God, and two, dwell in the land of Canaan. So we recognize from our readings that God called Abraham from Haran, and he brought him into the land of Canaan. His promise to Abraham was that this land that thou dwell in, I am going to give it to thee and to thy descendants. Right? We saw where he called Isaac, and he said the same thing to Isaac. This land which I tell thee to dwell in will be the land that I will give to thy descendants. Right? And thou shall dwell in the land, thou shall stay in the land. Abraham was, sorry, Isaac was about to go down to Egypt and he said, don't go down to Egypt, stay right in the land that I will show thee, right? Jacob was in the land, we just read it. He made himself a pillow, right, from stone and God appeared unto him and God said, this land that you lay on, I will give to thy descendants and he said, where you go, I will be with you, and I will surely take you back into this land. Oh, glory to God. So, he gave them what it is that he is expecting from them. Believe me, believe in my promise, and dwell in the land of Canaan. If God said it, so, so we have a responsibility in our bridging to believe God. God put some great and precious promises into the hands of Abraham, put some great and precious promises into the hands of Isaac and Jacob, and his expectation was for them to believe it. They were supposed to believe in the promises of God and to dwell in the land of Canaan. When God gives a promise, the responsibility that we have as men is to believe God. When God gives a promise as men, we must grab onto it, embrace it, hug it up firmly, and believe that God is true to his word. And I'm glad that the passage that we read in Genesis chapter 12, verse 4, the Bible said that Abraham did what God asked him to do. He believed God. But we are going to find out that even though he left believing God, oh glory to God, we are going to find that there was still doubt. And it caused, it, caused him to do some things that, you know, God was, didn't want him to do. Right? So, it is, if God said it, we must believe it. And if God said it, that settles it. Right? And we believe it. Faith is simply taking God at his word. Faith is simply believing that God will do exactly what he said. Abraham's faith is seen in Genesis 12 verse 4, like I said earlier on. Where the Bible said that he left everything and he believed God. In Genesis chapter 5, Chapter 15, rather, God told Abraham to count the stars. And he said, count the stars. We're talking about believing, you know. Because that is what God wanted them to do. Believe in the promise and then know, you know, be able to dwell in the land. So in Genesis chapter 15, 5 and 6, God told Abraham, Abraham, count the stars and see if you are able to number the stars. And God then said to Abraham, so shall thy seed be, so shall thy descendants, so shall thy children be as the stars of the earth. Just like how you were saying to Abraham, you cannot number the stars. And so it is. And he brought him forth abroad and said, look now towards the heaven and tell the stars if thou art able to number them. And he said unto him, so shall thy, it is God's word this to it. I want us to note this passage in a virgin because at this time when God spoke to Abraham, he had no children, had no seed, had no child. And God is saying to him, look, look at the stars. Look at the stars. 
Tell me if you are able to number them. So shall I make thy seed be. And he believed in the Lord and he counted it to him for righteousness. So God said to him, and he believed God, brethren. And believed God. So remember the passage. So at this time, not even a chick nor a child, Abraham had, but he believed in the Lord and God counted to him for righteousness. Let us go to the next slide. So, their responsibility was to believe God, believe in the promises of God, and to dwell in the place of blessing, the place that God called their forefather from, the place that God said, look here, this is the land that I will give to thee. God wanted them to stay in the promised land. Amen, somebody. So let us, yes, let us go to the next slide. So it was needful for them to stay in the place of blessing. It was needful to them to stay in the, bless, uh, the place of blessing. So just after Abraham answered the call of the Lord, there was a famine in the land, and Abraham went into Egypt. Abraham went into Egypt. It was needful for them to stay in the place of blessing. Abraham went into Egypt because of the famine. Yes, you have to sustain yourself. So he went into, he went into Egypt. Let us look at the story well. There was a famine into the land, and he went down into Egypt in the famine. What happened in Egypt? Before they went into Egypt, Abraham said unto his wife, let us tell them that you are my sister. Yes, they were half sister and brother. But tell them that you, were my, you are my sister. So he tell half of the truth. He really lied, right? Because he did not. He, he did it to deceive the men in Egypt. And if you read the story, when they went down into Egypt, the lady was so beautiful that as she went down there, the, 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 the men, they saw her and they took her to fear her because they said, fear alone must have these pretty ladies. And the Bible said that fear treat Abraham well because of his wife. And it was when God now plagued the house of Pharaoh that Pharaoh said, no, something is wrong. And Pharaoh found out that the woman was Abraham's wife. And he said, why you deceive me? And he sent them away in the famine. Told them that she was his wife to deceive. So he go down to Egypt. Virgin, you see, when we start going down to Egypt, remember, Egypt is a type of the world, you know. You see, when we start go to Egypt, we start do the things that the Egyptian did before he just on, on the way to approach Egypt. The first thing he did was to plan how he was going to deceive the people in Egypt. Oh, glory to God. And I'm saying to us, brethren, if God be God, we must serve him. We cannot serve two masters, and we know that. So, brethren, you cannot try to serve God and try to, to live in Egypt. The first thing that he did as he approached Egypt was that he tried to deceive the people. So, Isaac came on the scene. There was a famine in the land, and Isaac was about to go into Egypt. And God said to him, don't go to Egypt. There was a need for them to believe God. There was a need for them to dwell in the land. That was all that was required of them by God. And so what God said to Isaac, don't go down into Egypt. 
stay in the land during the famine, and I will sustain you. Virgin, I want you to understand, irrespective of where you are, God is able to sustain you. Say that, stay in the land. Famine in the land, stay in the land. And I will sustain you. He said, do not go down into Egypt. Live in the land where I, I tell you to live. Sojourn in the land. And I will be with thee. I will bless thee for unto thee and unto thy seed. I will give these countries. And I will perform the oath which I sear unto Abraham thy father. You see when God said, Sojourn in the land. What God say, no man, what that word sojourn mean is to steer. So God was saying to him, don't go down to Egypt. We can go to the next slide. Don't go down to Egypt. Steer in the land of blessings. Steer into the promised land. Steer into the land that I promise to your poor father that I am going to give. Brethren, they were to stay in the land and believe God and serve him. That was, is what was expected of Abraham and his descendants. Jacob and his children, as we go down, we will see it. They went into Egypt. They did not stay in the land. Let us go to point three. Failure to obey God's command. So we recognize from each of the dispensation that we did that God gave some command and I don't want to use the word simple command um, because it is obvious that it was challenging and it's obvious that there is something in man that when God says this is what we are supposed to do, it seems as if we always there's this tendency to do opposite to what God says. And even as we believe God as Christians and we try to be good Christians, sometimes it is challenging to do exactly the things what God say. And sometimes we feel, we buck with two, we fall down, and we have to say, God, um, forgive us. And even in this, this dispensation that we live in, you know, it is not a thing where you have to do physically. Because your Bible tells us that once you think it, brethren, you're guilty. So I don't want to use the word simple, simple, simple task to dwell in the land and to believe God. I don't want to use the word simple because there is just something in men that anytime God said this is what you're supposed to do, it is something that is pulling us to do the opposite. So look at the failure. The, fa the, the patriarchs and their descendants fail to follow God's command. Abraham failed in Genesis 12, 13. Hope I have the right scripture. In Genesis, sorry, it, God called him from the land and he went from the land of Aaron and he came into the promised land. He fell in Genesis chapter 12, 13. He went into Egypt as we just discussed. And he went into Egypt and he lied. He deceived the, 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 the king of Egypt. And he deceived the people of Egypt. And they sent him away because he brought a plague on the house of the king at that time. And they, they gave him gifts, yes. And they sent him away because they recognized that God was with him. But remember now the passage that we already know. And we said that God said to, 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 to Abraham, he said, look up at the stars in the sky. Tell me if you are able to number them. And God said to him, so shall I make thy seed. Oh, glory to God. So shall I make thy seed be. And then, look at his failure. Because God promised him and God, God 
promised him a son. And this son was supposed to come through him and his wife, Sarah. But his wife was able to convince him. Do, did we, do we remember in Genesis, early Genesis, when we discussed the dispensation of innocence, and he was able to convince Adam, oh, glory to God. Even when God gave Adam the command, the woman was able to convince the man. And we said that there is a certain thing about the woman that she's able to, to convince the man, and that is why she, she must make sure she check with God before she influence her husband. It is the same thing that we see playing out here. God gave the man a promise. God said, look here, you're going to get a son. And his wife convinced him to go into our handmaid, Agar. And that is found in Genesis chapter 16. And they produce a son. And God said, that was not the son. Bless God. That was not the son that I'm talking about. I want us to find the scripture in Romans 4, 20 and 21. Right? So, with Abraham fathering Ishmael, it was a sign of unbelief. It was a sign of unbelief. But after recognizing that that was not the will of God, he hold to what God had said to him, and then in the end, God rewarded him. So here's what the apostle said in Romans. He said, he staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God. And being fully persuaded that what he had promised, he was able also to perform. So, yes, the Bible said that he believed God. He believed in the promise of God. But before he was fully persuaded, left where he was, followed God by faith. When God told him that he was going to multiply his seed, just like the stars are innumerable, so the Bible said that he believed God and it was counted unto him for righteousness. But the fact that he went in unto Agar, was a sign of his unbelief. And it was after he began to believe God fully that it was recorded that he staggered not at the promise of the Lord. So they come, God called Abraham, spoke to him, but Abraham, though it is recorded that he believed, he failed. He went down to Egypt and he Father Ishmael, it was a sign of his unbelief. All that was expected of them was for them to believe and dwell in the promised land. Let us go to Isaac, because Isaac also feel Genesis chapter 25. Before Jacob and Esau were born, God said the younger would be the child to receive the blessing. But Isaac was, Isaac favored his older son, Esau. You know that your, your first son, your first son really, and, and Isaac, he, he, he loved Esau. And even when it was told to him that, look here, the older will serve the younger. Coming from God, you know. Isaac did not pay that any mind. Isaac favored Esau. And he decided, even when he knew what God required, that he was going to bless Esau anyhow. God said, I will bless Jacob. 
Isaac said, I will bless Esau. And he tried to contradict the word of God. And said, I will bless Esau instead of taking God at his word, which is faith. All things work out. Jacob and his mother planned and they trick Isaac because he was old and he was not able to see well. And they tricked him. And Isaac gave the blessing to Jacob. The same thing that God said, even though it was trickery that caused it to happen. And he blessed Jacob without knowing it. Finally, when Isaac found out that he was tricked, in bestowing the blessing on Jacob, he said to Esau, Behold, I have made him thy Lord, and all his virgin have I given to him for servants, and with corn and with oil have I sustained him, and what shall I do now unto thy son, unto my son? So it was in the midst of when, when Esau said, is there not one blessing, Jesus, is there not one blessing that you can give me? The Bible says that Isaac lifted his voice and wept because he gave all the blessing to Jacob. But this was the word of God. And Isaac was determined that he was going to bless. Esau. God said, I will bless Jacob. And Isaac finally agreed and said, Jacob shall be blessed. The man of faith agrees with God's word and does not contradict God. Right? And Hebrews 11 20 says, By faith, Isaac blessed Jacob and Esau concerning things to come. By faith, Isaac blessed Jacob and Esau concerning things to come, right? And he poured out the blessing upon Jacob and he recognized afterwards that this was what God said. But let us also look now at the failure of Jacob because all of these men you know, knew what supposed to do and, and, and they failed, Jacob's failure. God promised to bless Jacob's. Jacob, right? And we see the scripture there, Genesis 28, 13 to 15, Genesis 32, 24, and 35, 9 to 12. You know, we can read, read those in our spare time. So God said that, you know, Jacob, I am going to bless you. I, I, I told your father, same thing I tell your father. I am going to bless you. This land shall be yours. This land shall be the land in which I will bring your descendants to. And he tell him that he was going to bless him. But there were also times when Jacob doubted God. And this is found in Genesis chapter 42 and 36, right? Jacob was now an old man. And Jacob loved Joseph so much. And Jacob, and it was told to, jo, jo, to Jacob that Joseph was killed. And he loved Joseph's brother. And he was an old man and he you know, believed that, you know, it, he was not going to see his, son, his sons again. And he thought that he might also lose Benjamin. And Jacob, their father, said unto them, Me have he bereaved of my children. Joseph is not. And Simeon is not. And he will take Benjamin away. All these things are against me. And God told him that he would bless him. He would be with him. He will, everywhere he go, went, he will be with him. And in the midst of the situation, Jacob was now saying, that boy, man, man, this is it. All of the children that I love are taken away from me. Jacob cried in this period. All these things are against me, he said. All these things are against me. Instead of believing that God's blessing was upon him, he was acting as if a curse was upon him. 
in the middle of his difficulty. He should have trusted God. Before long, Jacob found out how wrong he was. God was working out his wonderful plan. And Jacob would have, should have seen that God was working out a plan. In the end of, at, the, at the end of the day, Jacob saw all his sons alive before he passed off. Including Joseph that he thought was dead. Instead of all things being against him, all things was working out together for his good. Bible says it in Romans 8, 28. All things work together for good to them that love God and to them who are called according to his purpose. So in the middle of his difficulty, he should have said, God, look here. I don't know what you're doing. And I want to encourage somebody in the middle of your difficulty. Don't lose faith. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. Don't lose faith, brethren. Understand that God is working out the thing for your good. And we know that all things work together for good. I remember years ago. Don't know why the Holy Ghost prompted me to say it. I remember years ago. I had a business at a certain location. I'm bridging every minute. When it's not the police, it's the KCC. When I get a call from the office, I get panic attack. And the, the thing got so much that, you know, I said, God, look here, find somewhere else for me because I can't bother with it. You see, when the, in the midst of the situation, you don't understand what God is doing. You know. But it was God pushing me and said, look here, go out and, and find. And I search and search and search and God said, see the property here. No, I have rest. You know, no KCC, you know police. But what I'm saying, brethren, is that in the midst of the situation, you are not aware, oh glory, what God is doing, but God is working out. And we know that all things work together for good to them. If you love God, brethren, me telling you that the thing is working out for your good. God have a plan for your life. Jesus and the plan that God have. You cannot step into the plan as you are. God have to build your faith. Bring your faith to a next level. God have to bring it to a next level spiritually. In order for you to know. Gain what God has for you. So it is working out for your good. God have a purpose. And he's working his purpose brethren. So. Jacob doubted. In the middle of his difficulties, he should have said, boy, look here, God trust you because me believe you. But you see, now that we know as, as Christians, these are the things that we have to do. You know, we have to say, God, we know. We know that you're working it out for our good. We are believing you. We trust in you that you are going to work it out for our good. So, Jacob feel. Let us go to the next slide because Jacob's sons feel. Amen, Virgin. Jacob, sons, feel. So Jacob had 12 sons, and we saw it from the chart that, you know, was on uh, one of those slides where it shows that I, Abraham begot Isaac, Isaac begot Jacob, and Jacob begot the 12 sons, which we said that it was the 12 tribe of Israel, right? So these 12 sons, knew the promise of God. They knew the promises of God. But Joseph was Jacob's favorite son. And, you know, out of all the sons, Jacob, Jacob made a suit for Joseph. More than that, Joseph had dreams, and he came and he told his father and his brethren here, heard, and when they heard, you know, it, they were jealous of him. They were jealous of how Jacob treated him because Jacob gave him special treatment, brethren. And they were jealous of how Jacob 
treated him. Because of this jealousy, we read in Genesis chapter 37, 20, that these brethren of Joseph wanted to kill him. Remember, these other sons of Jacob knew that the promise was not only for Joseph, but it was for all of them. But because of the special treatment, come now therefore, they said. They were in the field and Jacob sent Joseph to them in the field. So they said, come now therefore, let us slay him and cast him into some pit and we will say some evil beast and devour him. And we shall see what will become of his dream. And Reuben heard it. And he delivered him out of their hands and said, let us not kill him. And Reuben said unto them, shed no blood, but cast him into this pit that is in the wilderness, and lay no hand upon him, that he might rid him out of their hands to deliver him to his father again. Amen. So, because of the special treatment, the plan to kill him, and, and it was because of the intervention of God through Reuben that he said, no man, don't kill him, throw him down in a pit. Because he had the plan to come and take him out of the pit and to bring him back to his father. So even when they try to write off the plan of God, the plan of God must come to pass. And we said that in the last dispensation, that if the plan, anything God has planned, must come to pass. Anything he said must come to pass. And so I want us to know, Bridget, that these ten sons, because of the special treatment, they wanted to get rid of Joseph. They wanted to... To, to, to stop the plan of God, but the plan of God have to come to pass, right? And this jealousy that we saw in the brethren, in Joseph's brethren, Joseph's sibling, was the same jealousy that caused Cain, brethren, the same jealousy that caused Cain to kill Abel. I want to make this point to us, brethren, that as People of God. One of the things that we should be conscious about and we should be satisfied about is where we are in life and how God has made us as individuals. Because for some of us, we will be able to speak well. For some of us, we will study to a certain level. For it will not be the same for everybody. And we have to learn to accept where we are. For some people, they can pray long. But for others, they cannot pray long. And you have to learn to accept where you are. Don't get jealous over other brethren. Until you reach the point where you start wish bad for them. I want us to understand that jealousy operates like a cancer. It will take over your entire being. All Cain did, we said, was to give God what pleased God. God required a sacrifice and, God, and, and, uh, sorry, and Abel obeyed God and he gave God what he wanted. And because of this, Cain got jealous. And it is the same thing, brethren. Joseph was treated special. And God worked it out this way. But because of jealousy among his brethren, they wanted to kill him. If you have a jealousy in your spirit, brethren, it will lead to murder. Might not be physical, but in your mind, you murder your brethren. It is a spirit, brethren, and we have to be careful we, we allow such a spirit to, to attach itself to us. 
understand that you are beautifully and wonderfully made. Understand that some things that you see saints with you will probably never have some of those things. But God made you promises. And you have to have faith in those. Don't allow jealousy to, 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 to take you over. The promises that God made was for all of Israel's children. But they did not recognize this and wanted to kill Joseph. So the promise of the blessing was for all Jacob's children. But they tried to kill Joseph. Let us go to the next slide. So, Jacob's son, they feel they wanted to kill their brother, but they also feel in this aspect. They feel to return to the promised land. Due to circumstances, remember, there was a famine in the time of Abraham and he went down to Egypt. Right? And, but he came out, they sent him away. Isaac, during the time of famine, wanted to go and God said, look here, stay in the land, I will sustain this. When Jacob heard that Joseph was in Egypt, he sought the Lord. And God said, yes, go down to Egypt. So he went down there. The Bible says 70 souls went down there. But there was a famine in the land. Remember now God had sent Joseph before the fact to make a way for his virgin Joseph. He was elevated to, to second in command in Egypt because he was able to interpret the dream of Pharaoh. And he interpreted and he, 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 he told that there was going to be seven years of famine. And seven years um, where they will have plenty. And he told him, Fear said, Look here, if you were able to tell the dream and interpret the dream, then might as well you angle the, affair, the affairs. And he put him as prime minister in Egypt. And God sent him there before so that during the famine he would be. A, there would be a way to sustain his brethren. Now, Joseph gave instructions that when I die and when you leave in Egypt, brethren, take me bone out of Egypt. And they came into Egypt because of famine. They were given the land Goshen to stay in. And they multiplied in that land. Famine was finished. But all the children of Jacob remained in the land of Egypt. They could have said, the promise of God to us is that he will give us the land of Canaan. They could have said, all right, the famine is over. We're going back to our land. But they chose to stay in the land of Egypt. As a matter of fact, Jacob's 12 sons all died in the land of Egypt. God said, Believe my promise. Stay in the promised land. And when they went down to Egypt, because of circumstance, they fail in returning to the promised land. The Lord said unto their father, don't go down to Egypt. Jacob prayed before and got to go. Son that you wanted to see is down there, go. But when they go, all the children of Jacob forgot 
the promise of God and they stayed in Egypt. Let us now look at the judgment. The children of Israel became slaves into the promised land. Let us find Exodus 1, 8 to 14. They became slaves into, sorry, Egypt, right? When the brothers of Joseph sold him into Egypt as slaves, they did not realize that the day would come when all their children, all their descendants would also be slaves in Egypt. Long before it happened, God talked to Abraham, right? But they rose up. So Joseph was prime minister in Egypt. And because of prime minister, his brethren, his father and his brothers, got special treatment. They were given a piece of land and then said, look, you stay down in that land. But they stayed down there so long. The Bible now says, they rose up a new king over Egypt, which knew not Joseph. And he said unto his people, Behold, the people of the children of Israel are more and mightier than we. Come on, let us now deal with them, lest they multiply. And it came to pass that when they were fallen out anywhere, they joined also unto our enemies and fight against us. And so get them up out of the land. Therefore they did set over them taskmasters to afflict them with their burdens. And they built for fear treasured cities. Pythom and Ramis. Ramis. Ramesses. But the more... They afflicted them, the more they multiplied and grew. And they were grieved because of the children of Israel. And the Egyptians made the children of Israel to serve with rigor. And they made their lives bitter with hard bondage in mortar and in brick and in all manner of service in the field. All their service wherein they made them serve was with rigor. So, they spent the time, did not go back to the promised land, and they were now put in slavery. They rose a king that knew not the works of Joseph, and he put them in slavery. But God told Abraham before, let us go to Genesis chapter 15, 12, to 14, God told Abraham years before that this would happen. And when the sun was going down, a deep sea fell upon Abraham, and lo, an aura of great darkness fell upon him. And he said unto Abraham, Know of a surety that thy seed shall be a stranger in a land. That is, not theirs, and shall serve them, and they shall afflict them 400 years. And also that nation whom they shall serve will I judge, and afterwards shall they come out with great substance. So what God did in it was that, was that God, for all the years that they afflicted them, God caused them to come out with the peer. That they should have received. So God caused them to come out with great substance. But they stood the bridge. And the point that I'm making is that they remained in Egypt. When they should have left after the famine. And go back to the promised land. So they were afflicted for 400 years. That is a long time for anybody to be in slavery. After years of a hardship. And suffering. The Bible says that the children of Israel cried out unto God. In the midst of slavery, they, they, they couldn't take it no more. And they cried out unto God. I believe that somebody was there that remembered the promise of God. And they said, you know, said, God promised us another land. And they began to cry out 
unto God. And the Bible says that God visited them. And even in the midst of slavery, look at the promises that God made to them in Exodus chapter 6, 6 to 8. Even in the midst of slavery, God renewed his promise to the children of Israel. Wherefore say unto the children of Israel, I am the Lord, and I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians, and I will rid you out of their bondage, and I will redeem you with a stretched out arm and with, a, and with great judgment. And I will take you to me for a people, and I will be with you a God. And ye shall know that I am the Lord your God, which bringeth you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. And I will bring you into the land concerning the which I did swear to give it to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, and I will give it you for an heritage. I am the Lord. So God brought out his people out of the bondage and back into the promised land. The book of Exodus tells us, you know, about the going out of Egypt, right? And the book of Joshua tells us about the going into the promised land. You know, we must remember that God has never broken his promise, has never broken his word, right? And if God made a promise to the people that God is going to fulfill it, there was once a time when there was a king that did not like how Israel was prospering and he sent a prophet, sent Balaam as a curse the children of Israel, but he was not able to curse them. Why? Because God said that anybody curse you, he might go curse them, and anybody bless you, he might go bless them. It was God's word. And he was not able to curse the people. Anytime he opened his mouth, amen, there was just blessing. Blessing was just pouring out on the people. And, and Balak said, look here, I call you to curse. And all you do is bless the people. Go on where you go. Right. So, God is true to his word, brethren. He was true to his word. So the judgment that fell upon the people during this dispensation was that they were brought into slavery because they refused to go back to the promised land. They got comfortable in Egypt, brethren, and they got a land for themselves. Joseph was well known and they were well treated. But after that Pharaoh died and another Pharaoh rose, he treated them harshly. He brought them into slavery. He increased their tasks. And the people have to cry out unto God. And they spent 400 years in slavery because they did not go back to the promised land. Right, let us go to the next slide. Look at the mode of deliverance now. So the children of Israel, they were under bondage for 400 years. And their affliction caused them to cry out unto the Lord. And the Bible says that the Lord heard them. Right? And what God did was that he prepared a man. He prepared Moses to go and to deliver the people. And so what he did was that he caused Moses to grow, amen, up into the house of Pharaoh. And we can find that in Exodus 2. So what happened during the time of, of the birth of Moses? They were killing all of the man child. And Moses' mother and father saw that he was a goodly child and they put him in a little basket and they sent him down the river. And when he went down the river, bridging. Oh, glory to God. God caused Pharaoh's daughter to be bathed in, and she saw the baby, and she was moved with compassion, and she took him in. 
But guess what? God got this, the child's mother to take care of him in Pharaoh's house. But when Moses was of age, he, he knew who, who me, his people was, and he refused to become the son of Pharaoh's daughter. And he had to run from Egypt. God worked it away that he brought him into the wilderness. And taught him how to deal with sheep. Remember sheep is, is a kind of God people. Right? Jesus said, my sheep know my voice. Right? So sheep is really a type of God's people. So he brought him in the wilderness. Taught him how to deal with sheep. Which in essence, God was teaching him how to come and deal with his people. God did appear unto him in a burning bush. And sent him to fear. Tell fear to let my people go. Exodus 9 verse 1. So fear, he refused to let God's people go. Right? Then the Lord said unto Moses, go in unto fear and tell him. Thus saith the Lord God of the Hebrews, let my people go that they may serve me. So God was ready to move, ready to deliver his people, but Pharaoh refused. So Pharaoh refused to let the people go. God then brought a series of plagues. But fear still refused to let the people go. It was not until the ten plague fear decided to let the people go. Exodus 11, 4 through to 7. And Moses said, Thus saith the Lord, About midnight I will go out into the midst of Egypt, And all the firstborn in the land of Egypt shall die. From the firstborn of Pharaoh that sitteth upon his throne. Even unto the firstborn of the maid servant that is behind the mill. And all the firstborn of beast. And there shall be a great cry throughout all the land of Egypt. Such as there was none like it. Nor shall be like it anymore. But against any of the children of Israel shall not a dog move his tongue against man or beast. That he may know how that the Lord do it put a difference between the Egyptian and Israel. I want us to know, Bridget, that there is a distinction between the church and between the world. There was a distinction between e the Egyptian, which is a type of the world, and the children of Israel, which is a type of the church. And God said, I put a distinction between both. The key to their deliverance, oh glory to God, was their obedience. Exodus 12, 3 to 13. The key to their, of their deliverance was their obedience, brethren. Speaking unto all the congregation of Israel, saying, In the tenth day of this month, they shall take to them every man a lamb. According to the house of their fathers, a lamb for an house. And if the house will be too little for the lamb, let him and his neighbor next to his house take it according to the number of the souls. Every man according to his eating shall make your count for the lamb. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male of the first year. He shall take it out from the sheep or from the goats. 
and he shall keep it up until the 14th day of the same month. And the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it in the evening. And they shall take up the blood and strike it upon the two sides posts and on the upper door posts of the houses wherein they shall eat it. And they shall eat the flesh in that night, roast with fire and unleavened bread and with bitter herbs. They shall eat it. Eat not it raw, nor sudden, at all with water, but roast with fire, his head with his legs, and with the fruitens thereof. And he shall let nothing of it remain until the morning, and that which remaineth of it until the morning, he shall burn with fire. And thus shall he eat it, with your loins girded, your shoes on your feet, and your staff in your hand, and ye shall eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. For I will pass through the land of Egypt this night, and I will smite all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and against all the gods of Egypt will I execute judgment. I am the Lord. And the blood shall be to you for a token upon the houses where ye are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. And the plague shall not be upon you to destroy you when I smite the land of Egypt. So the key to their deliverance, brethren, was their obedience. It was their obedience that distinguished them between the Egyptian and themselves. Because if they had not, if they were not obedient and applied the blood, their firstborn also would have died. The difference was their obedience in the application of the blood. So the children of Israel were obedient to the command of applying the blood, right? And we can only receive salvation by being obedient to God's word. The Bible says, by, for by grace are we saved through faith. And that not of yourself is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. And as we speak to all the different dispensations, we recognize that the salvation is only by grace and faith in God. You can only receive salvation by accepting Jesus Christ as your personal savior. But the difference, Virgin, is that they were delivered by being obedient to the word of God. And so we recognize that as we gone through all of the dispensation, we see we are disobedient, person were disobedient. And obedience is better than sacrifice. And we see all throughout the dispensation is either you obey or you disobey. And as we go through, we are going to recognize the same thing goes for all dispensation. God will say, this is what you're supposed to do. And we, have, as men, has the responsibility to obey, to believe, and to obey. And this was what was expected of the children of Israel in this dispensation. Let us go to point six. Take away from the dispensation. So there's only one takeaway that I have, that I want to share. And it's that we should believe in God's promises, right? Hebrews 11, 6. So, but without faith it is impossible to please him. 
For he that cometh to God must believe that God is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Bridging, the first thing we're supposed to do, and we know it, when we come to God, you've never seen God yet. You just hear that God exists. But we're supposed to believe God when he called forth Abraham, right? Abraham did not know this God. He did not see the land. He did not know the land. But he believed God. When God promised him that he was going to make his seed innumerable, the Bible said that he believed God and it was quoted unto him for righteousness. Even with Noah, Noah believed God and it was quoted unto him. And the same thing with us, virgin, we must believe God. The children of Israel were given a promise, but they did not believe. They did not embrace it. That is why they remained in Egypt until the task got to them. Then they began to cry out unto God. God's word will not promise, will not profit us anything unless we mix it with faith. Think of a seed. A seed will serve no purpose on our kitchen cupboard. But when the seed is planted in the ground, it can grow into a wonderful plant and bring forth much fruit. But if we keep the seed at a certain place, it will not grow. God, God's word is like that seed. It must be planted deep into our hearts and we must believe that God that what God says, he will do. Suppose, suppose somebody said to you, suppose somebody said to you, I will give you $20, I will give you $1,000, right? And you put the $1,000 in, in, your, in your pants pocket. And you put on your pants, you didn't search your pocket, but you went to where you are going. If you do not believe that that, that $1,000 will be in your pants pocket, and it will serve you no purpose, because it is in your pants pocket, but you don't believe. You cannot spend it. Because you don't believe enough to just put your hand in your pocket that the money was placed in your pocket. If God gives you his word, hallelujah, if God, if God, God gives you his promise, we as, as individuals must plant it deep in our hearts. And we must believe. It is belief that is going to cause us to hold on to it dearly. Hallelujah. And, and take God at his word. It is only by faith. We are going to take God at his word. To know that if God... Say that he's going to do this thing. He's going to bring it to pass. So what are you doing? How are you using these promises that God has given you? Because when we get into the word of God, we recognize that there are promises that God has given us. There are promises that God has made to us. How are you using these promises? We can go to the next slide. How are you using these promises? In your daily life. Sometimes we end up frustrated. Sometimes we feel as if no one cares. We feel neglected. We feel dejected. Because we do not take the promises of God, we do not apply them to our lives. And mark you, God will make you personal promises. I, God have made me personal promises. 
But there are some promises that are written in the words, in the word of God, that we don't pay any mind. Look at point one. God promises us eternal life. 1 John 2, 25. God, if God says that he's going to give you eternal life, he's going to give you eternal life. And this is the promise that he had promised us. Even eternal life. The promise of forgiveness. Acts 10 and 43. God promised us that he is going to forgive to him. Give all the prophets witness that through his name, whosoever believe in him shall receive remission of sins or shall receive forgiveness of sins. He said that he will cast our sin in the sea of forgetfulness means that he will remember it no more. God promises us forgiveness of sin. So sometimes, you know, we buck our toe and we, we, it is harder for us to forgive ourselves than God forgiving us. Mark, you must take it hard. Means that God will not go in there again. But God promises us to forgive us of our sins. What about the promise of God being a constant present? Matthew 18, Matthew, Matthew 28, 20. God promises us that he is going to be a constant a present with us. Teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always. Even unto the end of the world. Amen. So Christ promised us in his word that he is going to be with us always. Matthew, sometimes we'll have feeling like nobody cares. Nobody is there for us. But God promises us that he is going to be there. David was in a place. The psalmist was in a place of, of where he feel alone. And he said, when mother or father forsake me, God will pick me up. And God promised us that he is going to be there. Lo, I will be with you always. So even in the midst of the difficulty, brethren, you might be wondering, where is God? Oh, glory to God. But God is right there. The psalmist says, for he is what? A very present help in the time of God is there in the midst of trouble. In the midst of your trial. In the midst of the difficulty. God is there. What about the promise of, of, of meeting our needs? Philippians 4. Hallelujah. Philippians 4, right? God promised us that he is going to supply all our needs. But my God, Jesus, shall supply all your needs according to his riches in glory by Jesus Christ. Yes, brethren, and no. But God said, He's going to supply your needs according to his riches in glory. The psalmist says, the Lord is my shepherd. Glory to God. I shall not want. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. Virgin. These are some of the things, you know, when we go through our, our daily walk. And we book up on some of the struggles. These are some of the promises that we're supposed to bear in mind. God promised always to meet our needs. According to his riches. In glory. God promises us to be. To help us. Hebrews 13. 6. So that we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper, and I will not fear what man shall do unto me. God is my helper. So you don't have to live your life in fear, Virgin. God will help you. God will protect you. God will guide you. God will keep you. So this is just the takeaway. If God give you the promise, Virgin, if God give you a promise, 
I want you to, to know that you can hold on to it because God will not fail in honoring his words. He said he's going to do it, Virgin. He's going to do it. He's going to bring it to pass. Let us go to what is it that we can learn about God. We must believe God. Believe in God's promises. What is it that we can learn? God honor his word. What do we mean by that? If God said that he is going to do something. So you see all of those promises that we read. That is written in his word. If God said that he's going to do them. You can bet your bottom dollar. That God is going to bring them to pass. You can bet your bottom dollar that God is going to do it. He said in Matthew 24, 45. He said heaven and earth shall pass away. But my words, oh Jesus, shall not pass away. Hallelujah. My words, he said, shall not pass away. Which means that if he say it, you and it not going to happen, you're going to see heaven and earth disappear. They shall be passed away. But because he's God and he honors his words, if he speak it, he will bring it to pass. If he said he's going to do it, he's going to do it. You know, you know, God is not like man. A man will make you a promise. A man will feel good at times and he will make you a promise. He will tell you something. And when he tells you something, brethren, when he not feel so nice, he's not going to say, look here, me did say that because I feel nice. And, and it is a broken promise. God is not like man. If God said that he's going to do it, he is going to do it. Men will give you false promises. Men will break their promises. But God will not. He will honor his word. If he says it, he will honor it. Numbers 23. Numbers 23, 19. God is not a man, hallelujah, that he should lie. Neither the son of man that he should repent. Had he said it? And shall he not do it? Or had he spoken it? And shall not make it good? Brethren, I leave you with this passage, with the scripture. If God says it, he is going to do it. And there is nothing that the adversary can do to stop it. There is nothing that the devil can do to, 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 to write it off. Joseph, brother, they try to, to stop. God said that he will bless all the children of Israel. Joseph, brother, they try to stop. Amen. What God said. They wanted to, but God provided a man to say, look here, don't kill him. And God worked it out that the blessing that he promised to all the children of Israel came to pass. Brethren, irrespective of who you are, irrespective of what you are going through, if God says that he is going to do it, I can encourage you today that he is going to bring it to pass. All we need to do as men is to believe the word of God. We need to believe the word of God. God bless you tonight. We hope that you would have benefit, re, benefited richly, you know, just by listening. We pray that, you know, God will continue to keep you, that God will continue to keep you near the cross, and that you will continue to dedicate your life to him. God's willing, we, we might have a break because of our convention, but after convention, we will gladly pick up and, and finish, you know, our discourse on, you know, looking at these dispensations. Just to see what is it that we can learn, to see what we can learn of God. And, you know, just to get a better understanding of, you know, the context of scripture. God bless you tonight in the name of the Lord. Just by way of announcement, remember that our...
fasting or a period or a 10 days period of fasting starts tomorrow. Remember, tomorrow we're doing it by group. So tomorrow we start with group one, that is 12 a.m. And we start with group one. And then after two days, then group two will pick up two days, group three, two days, group four. Right? So let us be faithful to God. You know, you might have stomach issues, you know, but you know what to do. Give God, you know, your best. And I guarantee that God will accept your best. Amen. So let us pray much during this time of consecration and pray much for, you know, a convention that is coming up and pray much for each other. God bless you in Jesus' name. Heavenly Father, we thank you, God, for all you have done. We thank you for all that you have been doing. We thank you for what was said tonight. We pray, God, that you will minister to your people, Jesus, and that you will cause them to, you know, keep near to the cross. We pray, God, that as you we dismiss tonight, that you dismiss us with your choicest blessings, that your perfect will be done, as we give you glory and honor. In Jesus' name, amen.